This is probably one of the darkest, saddest stories you'll ever hear. In 2006, Heather Kwan had the perfect life. She was a 21-year-old college student studying law. She had a loving family and a loving boyfriend. When she was a teenager, she would often volunteer to help kids in need. This is exactly why she went to law school, to become a defense lawyer and help those in need for the rest of her life. Tragically, her life would be cut short in the most horrendous way. Let's jump into Inside the Mind of a Man Who Slept Next to His Girlfriend's Corpse for Three Days. Heather had just moved in with her boyfriend, Ryan Waller, in a rented apartment in Phoenix. They had known each other for a long time, having been childhood friends and neighbors for years prior to their relationship. Her boyfriend was an 18-year-old gun enthusiast student. Now, you might be thinking, okay, mystery solved. Her gun-loving boyfriend did it. However, things weren't that simple. That same fatal year, 2006, Heather and Ryan decided to visit his father, Don, for Christmas and have a nice holiday get-together. Ryan's parents made dinner and waited for the young couple. When they didn't show up or answer their phones, Don got suspicious. I knew something was wrong, just had that gut feeling. He knew his son wouldn't just bail without calling first, so he called the local police and checked in on them to make sure everything was all right. Soon enough, the police came to their house and knocked on the door twice, but nobody answered. They kept knocking, but there was complete silence for hours. Finally, Ryan opened the door and let them in. And what the officer saw terrified them. The officer said he had a severe black eye that was swollen shut and looked like he had taken a couple of good punches. It appeared he, he had some injuries in his facial area. It appeared he possibly had been the victim of an assault. He seemed a bit strange and confused, but not violent. They quickly had to check on Heather as well, so they asked Ryan where she was. Sleeping in the bedroom, he replied. But when they got into the bedroom, they made a disturbing discovery. They saw her lying there completely still, dead, with a horrifying major wound to her head. The investigation later concluded that she was shot in the head on December 25th, the day before. So she wasn't sleeping, as Ryan said. Instead, someone had viciously attacked her. She looked as if she was in a deep sleep in the way she was laid. Except, she had a gunshot to her head. Who had done it? Was her loving boyfriend capable of murder? How was it possible that he didn't realize that she had been dead for so long? Keep watching and you'll find out exactly what happened. Now, naturally, Ryan was the first suspect for murder and got immediately arrested. But he wasn't taken to the hospital or the police station. Instead, he was made to wait in the police car for six hours while the police investigated the house, a fact that will be crucial later in the story. We see them walk out with somebody in handcuffs who looked like my son, but it's nighttime, and I could see this person, the side of their face was pretty mangled, and they put him in the back of a police car. After waiting in the car for six hours, Ryan Waller was taken to the Phoenix police station for the investigation. He was badly injured and needed medical help, but since he was a suspect for the murder of his girlfriend, the police didn't seem to care. Ryan looked extremely uncomfortable. When the officer made him sit in the chair for the interrogation, he put both his feet on the chair and laid his back against the wall. Just to showcase how strange he was behaving, I want to show you the next few clips. He tries to get up, but all in vain because he was handcuffed. Did I mention that he handcuffed himself? Yeah. He seemed to have forgotten that he did this and sat down again. He then took a piece of paper from the table and started tentatively reading it, but the sheet was empty. His discomfort was increasing with each passing minute. So when the officer came back to the investigation room, Ryan said, All right, do I get to go home? The officers looked at his odd behavior and assumed that Ryan was faking insanity to get a lesser sentence once convicted. The interrogator was showing signs of defense and agitation by crossing his hands and lowering his shoulders. It's obvious to see he's not buying what Ryan's trying to sell. You know why you're down here, Ryan? The whole time, Ryan maintained that he had no idea what was happening. Ryan's condition was getting worse as the time went by. He kept saying, I don't know, as an answer to most questions. I don't know, I don't know, I really don't. I don't know, man. The pain of injuries and trauma was getting unbearable for Ryan. Since the officer started the interrogation, Ryan was constantly sitting in more or less the same position, back against the wall, both his feet on the chair, resting on the table and touching his head with his right arm for longer periods of time. At first, he was demanding to go home, but after some time, he started saying, I just want to go to sleep, I got to sleep. 
he showed no signs of aggression or suspicious behavior. Ryan had lived with Heather for a few months now, but when the officer asked him, Do you have a girlfriend? He didn't reply. That's because he genuinely couldn't remember. There was a bit of aggression in the body language of the officer, which was making it clear that he was concerned about his interrogation more than the subject. He didn't want to help Ryan at all. He just wanted to prove that Ryan was guilty. There was one thing that Ryan was absolutely sure about, and that was who attacked him. Because when the officer was trying to figure this out, he answered with undeniable certainty that Richie Carver, his former roommate, and his dad, Larry Carver, hit him. There is a possibility that this was the last incident that happened to him before the injury, and that is why he remembered it so clearly. At a certain point, Ryan started getting annoyed from all the questions and the officer's persistence, and he expressed it by putting his feet down on the ground and bursting out, sadly. The officer didn't understand Ryan's situation. He was just focusing on the interrogation, despite being aware of the fact that Ryan wasn't answering properly. I mean, he didn't even know what he was saying. Ryan got really tired, and just like before, he again put his head down. Now, you might be confused about what's going on. Well, Ryan wasn't lying that the Carvers attacked him, and he even shot him in the head. Yes, you heard that correctly. Imagine first sitting in the police car for six hours, then being questioned like that for hours while having bullets in your head. You would probably get pretty annoyed too, to say the least. Ryan's brain injury had severely affected his memory. When he was asked about his birthplace, he said that he was born in Michigan, but actually he was born in Phoenix, in the same hospital where he would get treatment for his head injury later on. His father was born in Michigan, but Ryan could only piece fragments of his memories together. Still, the detective didn't have a clue. Ryan's condition was getting out of control when he suddenly stood up during the interrogation. The officer was blatantly ignoring that Ryan had severe health issues, so he carried on with his interrogation and Ryan felt compelled to sit again. Or maybe it wasn't so easy for him to stand for a longer period of time due to his severe injuries. Finally, after two hours, the officer decided that something was seriously wrong. He realized that Ryan's condition was getting worse and that he wasn't faking it. He observed his face injury closer and called a specialist team who confirmed Ryan had suffered a severe head trauma. He was then rushed to the hospital. The seriousness of Ryan's condition could have been estimated by the fact that he didn't even know the answers to the most simple and non-incriminating questions. After all, he had been shot in the head. And unfortunately, he didn't even get any medical help for almost three days. In the following interview, Ryan's father told the interviewer that, he had a bullet in his brain, six pieces of his eye socket, which was called a blowout on the eye socket, but six pieces of his eye socket were up in his brain. He had a fractured skull. He had a shot in the side of the head that just took part of the skull away, didn't penetrate the brain. And then he had a broken jaw. And the broken jaw, when I got to the hospital and found all his injuries, everything is done up here, but the jaw is broken down here. And I had asked the surgeon, how did his jaw get broke? And the surgeon didn't have an expla explanation. He just said, I have no idea, but it's not from the gunshot because everything is up here in his head. Instead of offering medical help to the victim, the Phoenix police treated him as a suspect in a crime. He had severe brain injury with multiple bullets in his brain, yet they interrogated him for almost two hours. Now there are some pictures of Ryan Waller who remains in critical condition in intensive care. His father just dropped off those pictures moments ago and said that uh, even if he did look badly beaten, he should have been given some medical attention. Now as far as the investigation into this shooting, well detectives are still combing the scene looking for any clues and are asking for the public's help at this time. While wasting precious time, Ryan's injuries increased during that critical time his life took a turn for the worst forever. The doctors later had removed a chunk of his brain, as well as his left eye. And that's not even all. Because of all of the brain damage, he couldn't function on his own anymore. So his parents had to take care of him. He had constant seizures where he would bite off his tongue. This poorly conducted investigation led to Ryan's death from a seizure 10 years later. And that's not all. The police covered their tracks. After they realized their stalling caused Ryan's rapid decline in health, they moved the date of the shooting from December 25th to the 23rd. That way, they made it look like Ryan had already waited for three days without getting any treatment. So I'm thinking that the police just changed the timeline because the more that they can further themselves, 
as far as when this happened and when they got him to the hospital, then it's less off of them. In reality, the police found him 12 hours after the shooting. He could have been saved. So the police were to blame for part of Ryan's tragedy, but who committed the murders? So Richie Carver and his father Larry shot both Ryan and Heather and stole some guitars and computers from their home. Richie and Larry had a long criminal record, both of them spending more time in prison than free. Richie, he's 24 years old at this time. He has an extensive juvenile history, but back when he was 17 years old, there was a man stopped at an intersection in the neighborhood, and he walked up to a car and he stabbed a man in the chest with a knife. He stole the guy's wallet from the guy and the guy's CDs, and he tried to make it home. I don't know if he made it home or not, but he ended up getting caught, and he served almost four years in prison. So we had only been out of prison about a year and a half. Apparently, Richard had spent a few days at Ryan's flat before Heather moved in. At one point, they got into a fight. Richard continued to stalk Ryan's house in the months following their argument, but no one suspected what he and his sick dad would do. Anyway, the Carvers were finally arrested. In 2008, Carvers were convicted, but not as you'd hope. Richie got life in prison with no possibility of parole, so he got what he deserved. Unfortunately, his father, Larry, got off the hook. You're probably wondering, how in the world can you get away with murder? Well, back then, there was a thing called marital privilege. Essentially, that means that Larry would initially get off because most of the evidence used against him was based on a confession he gave his wife. When she invoked her right of marital privilege and refused to testify, Larry would remain free. It was three days before the trial was going to start and she went to the prosecution and she said, I'm not going to testify against my husband, I'm claiming my spousal privilege rights. And they had to delay everything. So everything got canceled and then they started a separate trial for Richie that went on a month and a half later and then that subsequently went on for a few weeks and they found Richie guilty on all four felony charges and he's serving life without the possibility of parole so in the meantime they had let Larry out because they felt that Ryan's testimony alone wouldn't be enough to get a conviction that Heather Kwan's family appealed to Arizona legislators to use what would become known as Heather's Law to revoke the marital privilege law after some legal wrangling Larry Carver was reindicted in November 2011. He would be convicted of first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, burglary, and aggravated assault. Therefore, in 2012, after long legislative work, the father got a well-deserved life sentence as well, thanks to Maricopa County, attorney Bill Montgomery, and many others. If this sad story touched your hearts, as it did mine, you should check out Ryan's and Heather's obituaries online, and maybe send some flowers or simply positive thoughts.